Bill, do you ever get anything on it? Test, test, test. What about it, Phil? You getting anything? I pray that you being rooted and established in the love may have power together with the Lord, holy people, to grasp how wide, long, how deep is the love of Christ.
Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> as usual, let's go ahead and stand as we as we begin our worship. To Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled. And born aloft till it secured the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you <clears throat> and help you all your conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true to Christ be loyal and be true he needs brave volunteers to stand against the powers of sin move not hands or fears to Christ the Lord be true for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through to christ the lord be true to christ be loyal and be true in noble service prove your faith and your fidelity the fervor of your love to christ the lord be true for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through to christ the lord be true I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound. The song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane <clears throat> have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I've found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plan my feet on higher ground. You may be seated. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And He walks with me, and He talks with me, 
And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. No other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing <clears throat> the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Good morning. Uh, just a few announcements that we have this morning. Uh, as some of you are already aware, there's a funeral visitation this afternoon for uh, Butch Fazell from 1 to 3. Uh, the funeral uh, service will be held immediately after that. Um, because of that, small groups as well as our uh, family devotional this evening uh, have both been canceled. Um, so just be aware of that. A few dates that we also want you all to keep in mind. June 5th uh, is a Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, Greg needs as many, many hands here as possible to help move out the pews. Uh, we're going to put down the new carpet. Uh, if you haven't already told Greg thank you for a lot of what's been done in here, be sure to do that. Uh, a lot of work has gone in uh, into uh, to kind of renovating this space. But June the 5th, starting at 2 o'clock, uh, definitely want to be sure to, to keep that down. Uh, June the 6th, which is that next Monday, uh, the first summer youth series of the summer is going on. Uh, it'll be at Eastwood Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. Um, the bus will be leaving from here, and I'll get a time for that uh, a little bit closer to time. I uh, also want us to keep in mind June the 12th, there's going to be a wedding shower for Corey Ferguson and Jessica Lamastis, and we also want everybody to keep in mind that the 5th Sunday Fellowship is next week at Exchange Street. Uh, there's going to be a cookout. Uh, we're asked to help them by bringing drinks and or desserts, uh, and remember as a, as a part of that, there's going to be a cornhole tournament that evening. You and your partner have to be at least 30 years difference in age, right? That's one of those fun intergenerational things. There's a sign sign-up sheet out in the foyer uh, for you to sign up. Uh, if you've already told me that you're going to be participating, I haven't written your name down, so please go sign up anyway, uh, and just keep in mind for that. That's going to start at 5 p.m. next Sunday evening at Exchange Street. Anything else that I'm missing this morning? Bow with me in prayer. Father, at this time, we're all grieving over the loss of Butch, and 
we need to remember what you've told us in your holy word. That since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in our humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. In Revelation, John was told to write it down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, for they will rest from the labors and their good deeds will follow them. And we know without a doubt that this applies to Butch. As to those of us that remain, we grieve. But Father, we don't grieve like other people because we know that by your power you raised your son Jesus from the grave. And you've promised that you will raise us from the dead also. Butch is with you, Paradise, and we miss him. We're cognizant of what all the good he's done. We ask a special blessing on Patty and Shirley Dobbins and the rest of their family and what they're going through because it is like half of you has been torn away. But because of faith and because of your word and you cannot lie, your promise stands. And there will be a time when we will all get together and that you will wipe away all tears. Comfort the family, comfort us, and help us to realize that as long as we're in Christ, we have nothing to fear, including death, which is the last enemy that you will destroy. We also ask a prayer and blessing on Steve and Beth Muse, Brenda and Roy Saker, my Betty, uh, Nia's mother-in-law, Betty Jo Wheeler, Jess Whitesides, Jerry and Betty Chandler, Miss Hazel Cunningham, who just had shoulder surgery, Vernon Parker. Dear Father, please bless Barbara Long also. Please bless our congregation here. May all go well today, and may we comfort as much as we Christianly can Patty and Candy and her family. Continue to give us strength to do your will and to spread your word. Please bless our country. Bless our two new graduates, and may they have a long and fruitful life in your service. Guide us and direct us, and always, Father, may your will be done, because we understand that no plan of yours can be thwarted. We thank you so much for the unmounted love you had when you sent your son to die for the creation. And may we never forget that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died, for man's the creature's sin. But drops of grief 
can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. I'd like to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity we have this morning to gather around your table to partake of this law to the Christian that represents your son's body who died on the cross for our sins. Father, we just pray that we put the cares of this world out of our mind right now and go back to that day of the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Those steps are harder to get up when you get my age. <laughs> Bow with me, please. Our Father, again, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity this morning to gather around your table to take of this place of the Father, that represents your son's blood who died on the cross that day. Father, let us picture the spear going into Jesus' side and the blood flowing free. Be with us now as we partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
For a separate part of our service, I'd like to read a couple of verses from Second Corinthians. But this I say, who, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have now to give back to you a portion of that which you have so richly blessed us with. Father, we have so much according to the rest of the world, Father. Just be with us as we give and let us give in a cheerful manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. It is a great day to worship our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I have very conflicting feelings this morning because I love the rain. I really do. Um, it, it, it hinders playing golf from time to time, but I really do love the rain. The problem that I have, the reason I get conflicted on days like this is because uh, it really has a tendency to make you get a little bit heavier eyed than normal. Right? And so as a preacher, you can understand why that would cause some hesitation when people just naturally want to go to sleep as it is. Uh, but I am thankful that you are here this morning. Uh, whether you are here by your own accord or whether somebody drug you to church this morning, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I hope that everybody at some point in their lives will uh, come to appreciate the opportunity that we have on days like today to get together to worship, to uplift one another, to encourage one another, to help one another through struggles. Uh, but regardless, I'm glad that you are here. In a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song. Uh, we do this just about every week. Uh, it's that time that we've set aside for you specifically. It's the Lord's invitation. It's not ours. It's open 24-7, as we say consistently. But it's that time that if you have uh, prayers that you would like on your behalf, if you have struggles that you'd like to be made known, if you want us to rejoice with you, We'd love to do that too. If you want to put on Christ in baptism uh, and to begin walking in faith for Him, we would love to do that for you this morning as well. This year, our theme has been Be the Church. We've talked a lot about this. Being the Church has been our focus for the year of 2022. And we've done this, or this is our theme, with the understanding of what our mission is. When we talk about being the church, what it is we're supposed to accomplish, we've done this in a way that is consistent as part of being the church. We want to live in a consistent manner. We want to be able to say and do things that are consistent with Christ. But we want people, most importantly, to see in our families and our communities and those we interact with, we want them to see Christ in us. That's part of what being the church is. Over the summer months, we're going to dive into this theme even a little bit more. We're going to start a brand new series in June and July that we're going to entitle, You Had One Job. We're going to look at simple tasks that were given to people throughout Scripture and those that succeeded in those tasks and those that failed in those tasks. It's a great opportunity for you to be able to reach out to invite others to church as well as grow in your own Christian walk. So I'm excited about that series that's going to start in just a couple of weeks. And so I'm excited about that uh, coming up. But it's all about this idea of being the church. Part of that that we've looked at this particular month is a challenge that we've given to everybody in the terms of thinking about perspective. How our perspective is different than the rest of the world. We've looked at through this idea that perspective that we're striving for, that we live with, doesn't mean that we just think about those things, but it's that perspective that drives us to act differently. All right? It's one thing to look and view and see things through a different perspective. It's a whole other thing to acknowledge that and to allow that different perspective to move us to live in such a way that represents Christ to the rest of the world. And so that's our challenge this morning. But interestingly enough, that theme for the year and this challenge for the month also plays a big role in one other aspect of our life that we haven't yet talked about today, and that is our language. I'm sure you've heard Ron say this a thousand times. I've caught on. I love this phrase, right? Words mean things, right? Some of y'all already knew what I was going to say before I said it. I just had to say language and Ron, and you knew exactly where I was going. Words mean things. But I also would, uh, would say, Ron, that not all the same words mean the same things. And that's really interesting because the English language is weird. The English language, I don't know that there are any English teachers in here this morning. I know Nancy's in the nursery, so I can get away with saying this, right? The English language is weird, right? Almost to the point of being annoying, because within the English language, there's like a thousand other different little languages that make no sense to anybody except people in a particular field. What I'm referring to is that language within a language that we like to call jargon. There are words that we can say that mean certain things depending on what our jobs are, where we live, what our age is, that not everybody's going to understand. So for example, if I were to say that we need to do a renal dosing for this IV ertapenem for her polymicrobial ESBL UTI due to a creatine clearance of 25 from CKD secondary to longstanding DM and HTN, there's maybe two people, three if you include me, because I googled all those words so I know what they mean, <laughs> right? There's maybe two, three people in here, Max, that know exactly what that means, or at least have an idea of what that means. Most of us 
and before Google, right, wouldn't have any real idea what that means. But that's that's a language. All of those words are in, in English. I promise. Okay. But not everybody knows what that means. Or if I were to say something along the lines of this, the product 2406 does not fit that amortization term in Centric, but it will in BMS. So go into the forms library, manually create a BGM 545 with the Agribank schedule, then send a COLA to Key and Cornerstone. FPS has approved this method for our association. I'd be willing to bet that nobody outside of my wife, because she's the one that gave me that particular phrase, <laughs> has any idea what that means. And we simply live with different jargon in every aspect of our life, from our jobs, which is what this is, to maybe the region that we live in, right? Every good southerner knows that there's a very distinct difference between you, y'all, and all y'all, right? Those are three very different, distinct groups of people. We have jargon that changes from generation to generation, right? Some people in here know exactly what I'm talking about. If I were to use the phrase that I wanted to shoot marbles behind the soda fountain, some people have no idea what a soda fountain is. Others, closer to my generation, know the pain of hearing the phrase that I just lost the game. Right? There's so many of those things. I'm getting really dirty looks from three people in here because those are the only people that know what that means. But again, it proves my point. There's different jargon of every aspect of our life, including that of being a Christian. See, Christians use jargon all the time. We say things like propitiation or sanctification or better yet, have you ever heard a prayer uh, from either a younger or older gentleman and they said something along the lines of, Lord, please guide, guard, and direct us. Right? That's Christian jargon. Bring us back at our next appointed time. That one gets said a lot. My, my personal favorite, there's a, an older gentleman where I grew up going to church who, uh, who every prayer he said, God, we love you, we thank you, please place a hedge of protection around us, which I never understood what the hedge was. Like a wall made sense to me, a hedge, not so much. But those are things that we say as Christians, that if we're not a Christian, probably don't really understand what those mean. Sometimes when we are Christians, we don't have a full understanding of what those things mean. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at a phrase that I like to classify as Christian jargon that we say really often, but I don't know that we, I don't know that it means exactly what we think it means, right? There's a, I, I didn't put the picture up here of the, the princess bride, I think it was. I don't know that that word means what you think it means. But there's a phrase that we use that we say, their own faith. Their own faith. We use this expression a lot. And it's almost always, not always, but almost always in reference to when we're talking about raising our children. We're talking about new converts in Christ. That they're going to have to just develop their own faith. We want our kids to have their own faith. And why I think that's a good idea, and why I think that a lot of times, if not every time, it's said with really good intentions, I don't know that that means what we think it means. Every time we bring up, almost every time we bring up this idea, what we're trying to say is that kids are going to have to get to the point where when they stand before judgment, they're going to be judged based on their own faith and their own actions, right? We, we want kids to develop their own faith. And I understand where we get that idea from, and at times it's a very correct idea, right? If you look at Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed and He will repay each one according to His works. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 says, where it says the Lord will come and bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether it is good or evil. So I understand where we come from when we say the phrase, their own faith. And I'm not saying that that's a wrong ideology, right? Because the Bible makes it very clear that you and I will stand before God on judgment day and will give an account for everything that we did. Not for what somebody else did, not for the life somebody else lived, but for what we did, whether that's good or whether that's bad. It's a very sobering, very humbling thought, right? We can't rely on the life of somebody else or the faith of somebody else to get us to where we need to be. But this morning, what I want our goal to be is to represent this idea that children need their own faith. 
and hopefully look at and see that there's a difference between maturing and growing into a faith that has been instilled in you and creating your own faith from scratch. I also want us to point out that if we're doing our job as Christian parents, as members of the church in general, that part of raising children means instilling our faith in them. And so I want us to look at just a few things this morning as to why I think their own faith is not always what we think it means. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is I want us to understand that faith is not something that comes about easy. See, we as Christians say things and we live things that are simple but are not necessarily easy. There's a lot of living the Christian life that is simple, right? There's a lot of things that is a simple thing to do that we're told to do as a Christian, right? Don't lie. That's pretty simple, right? Don't cheat, don't steal, don't kill people. Those things are simple endeavors, but they're not always easy. And so I think when we say, well, kids just need to have their own faith, that's really simple in premise, but it's not something that is that easy. See, we're told in Romans chapter 5 that faith is built on suffering, which produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. But nowhere does it say in Romans chapter 5 that that is an easy process to come about. Because life is hard. Establishing a faith is difficult. James chapter 1 says to consider it pure joy when you go through trials because that perseverance is the result of the testing of your faith. It doesn't say anywhere that that's going to be an easy endeavor. 1 Peter chapter 4 tells us not to be surprised when a fiery ordeal comes to test you, but to rejoice in the sufferings of Christ. Nowhere does it say that that's going to be easy. Trials, by their very nature, are not easy. The faith that we're trying to build up doesn't come easy. Now, it may come easier for some than others. Some may start in a, in a position that's closer to where they end up being long-term than, than those that started, but Scripture makes it very clear that just because something is simple does not mean it's going to be easy. In fact, Scripture is incredibly clear that life is not going to be easy for those of the Christian faith. And yet, for some reason, as we go throughout Scripture, you can look in story after story after story. I love the VBS stories, right? We don't necessarily treat VBS stories in their correct context. And what I mean by that is, is we like to make them kid-friendly, right? If you go back and you really study the Bible, there's not a lot in there that's quote-unquote kid-friendly, right? But we like to do that. If you go back and you look at all these different accounts of Scripture, you will find where God's people were obsessed with trying to get things done in as easy of a way as possible. If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, chapters 15 and 16, the people of Israel wanted their journey to be easier. They complained about not having food. They complained about not having water. They looked to God and they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt just to kill us? It was easier when we were slaves because we had meals, because things were provided for us. Yet, you freed us and yet our lives are harder. They complained so much about wanting food and water that, that most ended up getting in trouble. In Exodus chapter 32, they wanted their worship to be easier, so they built a golden calf. Talk about being impatient. Moses goes up onto the mountain, he comes back down, and they've completely replaced the God that just freed them. Numbers chapter 13, the people of Israel wanted life to be easier, so they rejected the promised land. Because the fear that they had was so overwhelmed inside them. They wanted things to be easy. They wanted things to be simple. And so because of that, they rejected the promised land. were doomed to, to wander in the wilderness. And the sad thing is, is that it's the same for you and I today. I fall into a particular generation called the millennials. Right? I don't necessarily like being uh, coupled in that generation, but that's just how we've come to kind of separate the generations, and the millennials get a lot of uh, stereotypes thrown their way, some of which don't bother me all that much. One does, and it's that millennials are lazy. And the reason I don't like that is because for me, personally, myself, I don't consider myself to be a lazy person. Sure, I have an occasional lazy day, right, because I think everybody needs one of those eventually, but I don't consider myself to be a lazy person. And what I've come to learn is, is that millennials are not called lazy because we lack a work ethic. Millennials are called lazy because we share a very common trait amongst a lot of other generations in that we want, whatever to be, we want to accomplish whatever it is we want to accomplish in the easiest way possible. 
And I think a lot of people in life, not just the millennial generation, have that same endeavor, that we see where we want to go. We want to go from point A to point B, but we want to make sure that we do so in the easiest, most convenient way possible. And I've got to be really blunt with you this morning. We see that a lot in the church. We see that a lot in churches wanting to build up this ideology of I would love to go from 100 people to 150 or I would love to go from 150 to maybe 300 people. That's where we want to go. And you start talking about how do you want to get there and we go, okay, what's the easiest, quickest way possible that we can go from point A to point B? And it really irritates me. Again, I'm being personal with you this morning, right? You're getting to know me. I've been here a year, okay? It really irritates me when the church looks and says, what's the easiest way I can go about accomplishing this? What's the easiest way I could go about and accomplishing the will of God? The way that Christ wants me to live. What is the easiest way that I can go about trying to live the way Christ wants me to live? And it doesn't just reside in the church. It leaks out into every aspect of our life. Why do you see people arguing with each other on Facebook? Well, because it's easier to insult somebody from behind a keyboard than it is to have a conversation with them face to face. It's easier to do things. And the reason that it irritates me, because we get caught up in these petty squabbles, we get caught up in trying to do the easiest thing possible. The reason that irritates me so much is because Christ did not come and live and die for us so that we could do things as easy as possible. He didn't come and sacrifice himself and give us the example of how we're supposed to live so that you and I could do the bare minimum. No, Christ came and lived and died and sacrificed himself for us so that you and I could sacrifice for him. And there's nothing about sacrifice that's easy. It wasn't easy for Christ to go to the cross. It's not easy for us to sacrifice to live for him today. But I'm really tired of people, the church, the world in general to look at what's the easiest way I can get something done. Because your faith doesn't come easy. Anybody that's lived, anybody that's grown up, anybody that's matured in their faith understands and probably can look back at times where defending their faith or establishing their faith or maturing in their faith came with really hard conversations or that came with really hard moments in their life where they had to really look at what they were dealing with, what they were struggling with, what was going on around them, what was the process they were going to have to go through. Whether it was addiction or marital problems or or loss or friends abandoned them or they realized they were going to have to give up something that they didn't want to give up. That stuff doesn't come easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be worth it. And it is. But when we say kids just need to have their own faith, it's a simple practice but it's something that doesn't come that easy. And it's our responsibility as a church, our responsibility as parents especially, to make sure that they navigate this difficult thing to the best of their ability. They don't figure that out on their own. Anybody that has raised teenagers, right? I haven't, but you know, I'm getting there. Anybody that's raised teenagers understands that it's really difficult to get teenagers to do exactly what you want them to do, right? Nobody said amen to that. That's impressive. Um, It's not easy. Faith just doesn't happen. It's worked at. And so I want us to be sure that we remember that. Secondly, I want us to understand that our faith is meant to grow. I'd like to think that everybody in here, everybody listening online, I'd like to think that everybody would agree that faith is something that is important and is essential to our Christian life. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to Him must believe He exists, and He rewards those who seek after Him. Right? Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. But that faith can't stay in the same place forever. Right? When you're young, especially if you grew up within the church, most of the time your faith starts and is established based on a sense of fear of consequences, right? When you're young, that idea, that faith that you've started with, we begin to think about faith as young children. A large part of that faith is built on, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to suffer the eternal consequences, and so therefore I'm going to go this direction. We do that in every aspect of our life, right? From the time that we are in first, second grade, we want to make A's. Maybe not that young. I don't, I don't know. Maybe everybody gets an A in first and second grade. I don't remember, right? But we, we don't want to get an F. Therefore, we do enough so that we, you know, can go the other way. I, I know so many kids. 
What are we talking about? Small groups. So I'm going to tell in our small group. Small groups, right? We were talking about grades in college and high school. And the, the comment was made that C stands for completion, right? The joke, D's get degrees. We just don't fail. That's the standard, right? It's not about striving for the A. It's about don't fail. Our faith, when it starts out as young, young, young Christians or young, young people, Especially if you grew up in the church, it starts with, I don't want to go to hell, therefore I'm going to do the opposite. And I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm not saying that's bad, I'm not saying that that's something that should be discouraged. I'm saying that your faith cannot stay in that place. If you want to live a fulfilled Christian life, if you want to serve Christ to the best of your ability, if you want to truly represent, if we want to truly be the church... Your faith can't stay in that spot. That's the kind of faith that leads us to living bare minimum Christian lives. That's not the life that Christ intended for us to live. That's the kind of faith that makes us become lukewarm Christians. It's the kind that says, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to do the absolute bare minimum I can to make sure that that's not my faith. Your faith has to grow. It has to mature in a sense of where I'm not focused on hell, I'm focused on I want to serve God. Christ. The things I do, I want to do because I love Jesus. That's how Christ ought to be represented. It's that kind of faith that leads us to becoming doers of the Word and not hearers only. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see multiple examples of kind of the same thing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babes in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready for it, because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, you are, not wor- uh, you are, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? Hebrews 5, 1 Corinthians 3, this one, multiple times you see that Paul is sitting there and he's writing. He's saying, you should be here. It's like, I've given you the instruction. I've given you the teaching. I've worked with you. You should be past this, but you're not. Your faith is supposed to grow. Your faith is designed to grow. And there's a lot that goes into that growth, right? You plant a seed, it's got to be given the right kind of environment. It's got to be given the right kind of nurture. It's got to be given the right kind of attention. It's got to be given the right kind of food and nutrients. It's got to be worked with and, and cultivated but it's got to be able to grow. Your faith can't stay in the same place forever. I think sometimes one of my, one of my pet peeves in the church is that we get our faith established when we're 21, 22, 23 or younger, and then we get to be in our mid-40s or later and we think that we're not allowed to change our mind about something because that would mean that our faith is weak and that may not be the case at all. It just may mean our faith is growing. Your faith is designed to grow. It has to be able to grow. But before it can grow, your faith has to be planted. Anybody in here plant small gardens? I know we've got several farmers. Anybody in here like to plant small gardens? Right? Anybody in here start those small gardens? So I'm going to be honest with you. Chesna in here, I'm going to tell you. We cheat. We go to Lowe's and we buy little seedlings that are already, you know, little plants and it's, it's worth it for us. But start with the seed, right? Seeds get planted in a lot of different ways. You plant seed differently if you're looking at a small little raised garden bed versus if you're planting 140 acres of corn, right? Seeds get planted in a lot of different ways. Ironically, when you're a minister or looking to go to a different church, one of the questions that's always asked, in fact, it's almost always the first one asked, is why did you decide to get into ministry? And there's a long answer and there's a short answer. The short answer for me was my grandmother. Every time I ever told my grandmother growing up what I wanted to be, she would tell, if it wasn't preacher, she would tell me, you missed your calling. You're wasting your time, right? Now, I don't think I would have failed at whatever I did, but my grandmother constantly planted that seed in the back of my head that I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing, right? And because of her, I am where I am as well as several other people. But seeds get planted in a very different way. And if we want to see anything grow, that seed has to be planted. Jesus tells us that in the parable of the sower, which you can go look at in Matthew chapter 13 or Mark 4 or Luke 8. The seed has to be planted before the seed can grow. It's got to be put in the right spot. It's got to be given the right kind of attention. And so the natural question for us becomes, well, Nathan, if a seed has to be planted, who's supposed to plant the seed? 
My question to you is, why would it not be parents? Again, I know it's hard, right? I've got a two-year-old and a four-week-old, and this, this guy's going to talk to me about parenting, right? But it's Scripture. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a a child in which he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I don't want to treat anybody, I don't want anybody to mistake that as, as a guarantee, Right? We have the ability to choose things. We have free will. We can choose all these things. But Scripture makes it very clear that if seeds are going to be planted, it has to be planted by those who are closest to us. In fact, if you go and you look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writing to Timothy says, I recall your sincere faith that first lived where? In your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice, and now I'm convinced it is in you also. That faith has to be planted. That's the goal. To be able to know exactly where your children's faith came from. I, I cannot tell you story after story of, of minister who, uh, whose children have, have fallen away. And it's always been the same that the parents, the, the children will come to them and say, you've raised me to be the kind of person that you wanted me to be. And I've had so much respect for preachers that have gone, yeah, exactly. Why would I raise you to be the kind of person that I didn't want you to be? Something there just doesn't click. And when we look at Scripture and we talk about the responsibilities of parents, we talk about the responsibility of a community of Christ as a whole, it's about making sure that the faith that we instill in others is still there, is growing, is going in the right direction. We want to be able to look at our children's faith. We want to be able to see their willingness to serve God and say that to the best of my ability, I put that in them. Right? I planted, I watered, God's going to give the increase when it talks about evangelism, but I've got to be able to put that seed in my children, to plant my faith in them. That's our job as parents. And I don't say that to take away from any of those of you in here that might have had their faith planted in them by somebody else. There's all sorts of different ways people come to Christ. Maybe it was that you're now spouse planted that seed of faith in you. Maybe it was somebody that you grew up with going to church that was a, a quote-unquote adopted grandparent, right? For me, it was Bob and Kathleen Caldwell. No relation to them whatsoever, but my parents showed up to church, and I had red hair, and they said, he's mine. That's just how it worked. Until the day both of them died, I stayed at their house once a month, every weekend. Loved those people to death. I got to sleep on a little... Uh, uh, Murphy bed, that's what it was called, right? Right in front of the TV. I watched Peanuts cartoons. <laughs> but he always had a Bible, Mr. Bob always had a Bible open on his kitchen table. Always. I don't know if it stayed open to the same place for years. I never looked. But I noticed he always had a Bible on his table. Sometimes it comes from people that we just find ourselves in community with. But I also want to ask you a question if you're a Christian parent, because I understand that it's not, you know, I, I get it, right? It, it's a hard job. It's not impossible for your kids to develop their own kind of faith and a mature faith that doesn't look like yours. But as a Christian parent, why would you not want to put your faith in your children? I'm asking myself that question too, right? I've not found a good answer as to why I wouldn't want to. Why would I not want if I'm convicted in my faith, why would I not want to instill that in my children? Now, this is not me saying that I believe that children will spend their entire life agreeing with every opinion that their parents ever had, okay? I'm not that dumb, right? I don't agree with everything that my parents ever believed. I agree with a lot of it, but not everything, Right? Anybody that's, again, raised a teenager, you know it's impossible for you to get your kids to agree with everything that you have to say, even though at times, most of the time, he, teens, hint, hint, wink, wink, most of the time, they know better than you do. But you're not always going to agree with them, and that's okay. I'm also not telling you that just because you instill your faith in your child, it's a guaranteed success story. You and I also know better than that. What I'm asking is, why would you not want your faith to be what shines through in your kids and allow them to grow into it, to mature into it, to become their own faith eventually that they're going to be held accountable for, that they're going to live their life by, but to know that it started because you did your job. 
I just want us to reconsider the phrase, their own faith. Because it starts by us giving it to them. There's also a young person here this morning that's listening that is incredibly insulted about what I've just said. Right? Because I am my own person. I don't want to have my parents' faith. I'm not 100% convinced that my parents know what's right. And so I want to be my own person. I want to make my own decisions. I want to do what is good for me, and I'm going to figure it out on myself. And to that I say, okay, God gives you the ability to choose to do that. God does not force you to believe everything that your parents believe, but I also want to ask those same young people, why are you so against having your parents' faith? And if the answer is anything other than, well, it goes against the will of God, or I can look at in Scripture where my parents have this particular topic wrong, I would encourage you, one, to go talk with them about that. But if it's anything other than that, I would really, really like for you to reconsider your position. I am incredibly proud that I grew up with the parents that I grew up with. I'm incredibly proud that I grew up in the church that I grew up in, although to this day I do not agree with every single thing. That happens. But I'm glad that somebody cared enough about me that they put their faith in me and that I've been able to grow and mature and create my own faith to be able to do the things that I do today, not just as a preacher, but as somebody who gets to live for Christ every day. So whose faith lives inside you today? Whose faith lives inside you today? Is it a faith that's growing or is it a faith that's become stagnant? Is it a faith that wants to boldly proclaim and share Christ with others or is it one that still just doesn't quite have the confidence to leave this room? This morning, if you are struggling or if you want to put your faith on display, put it into action by putting on Christ in baptism, we would love to help you this morning. If there's anything you need, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?